Hey, what's up, everybody? Mogi on Monster here, and welcome to Why the Fascination, or WTF as I like to call it. Um, it's been a while. It's been about a little over a week since my last video. And um, today's guest, I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing his stories. They are um, Bigfoot encounters, Bigfoot stories. Um, and that's kind of what got me where I am now, you know, my fascination with Bigfoot. Um, but Without further ado, let me let me introduce you to um, Mr. Mark Robbins. Mark, thank you for coming on. I appreciate you sending me your email. Um, it was really, you know, interesting uh, interesting email. You know, so um, first of all, you know, you told me that you know you spent twelve years in the Navy, and I, I really want to thank you so much for serving. I appreciate um, that. Oh no, we appreciate it as listeners. Uh, and you've had you've had some weird encounters, so why don't you uh, just jump on in and, and tell us about it and, and where it took place and just you know walk us through. All right. Well, well my name is Mark. I spent, like uh, Russell said, I spent 12 years in the Navy, and I spent eight of those stationed up in Whidbey Island, Washington, and uh, we call it the Rock. And uh, eight years of that I spent uh, in my career up there, and. Probably five years of that, I was in a seagoing outfit. And on my last tour, I was winding up right before I got out of the military. Uh, I was on shore duty. And so I had a lot of flexibility a lot of time. I was an E6, and so I could take off and do things. And so kind of get going on what was happening up in that area. Um, I had a buddy check in in my shop, and he was a fellow E6. And uh, we basically hit it off the bat, and we... Uh, we did a lot of stuff together. You know, he was a running partner, what he was basically for us. And I don't mean running as in jogging. I'm just talking about we're sailors. We're doing whatever we want, you know. And uh, so he would stay at my house during the weeknights, camping out on the sofa. And on weekends, he would go home. He had a home in Bremerton, Washington, where he had been stationed over there. Uh, he was in uh, P3s, basically sub chasers and stuff like that. And so he would go home to his wife and then come back. Well, you know, we got to run around a lot. So him and I got involved in the buckskinning crowd, you know. So if you guys don't know what buckskinning is, it's basically 1820s, 1840, uh, 40s, fur trade, you know, mountain men reenacting. And so, you know, running around wearing elk hides, deer hides. Uh, we built our own rifles, single shot, you know, 54, 50 caliber uh, muzzle loaders, right, cap guns. Um uh, I made my own knives, did leather working, all kinds of stuff, you know. And uh, so we had uh, decided to go hunting together. And uh, so the first time, the, I, I want to say this is probably our first, this is a kind of an odd occurrence. I don't know so much if it was a Sasquatch. It was just really creepy. And we went to a little place. Um, they call it Twisp, or I'm sorry, they call it Mystery Camp. And uh, it was a popular place for the guys that hunted mule deer to go. And uh, so this is early 90s, 91, possibly 92. Um, so we go to a mystery camp, which is near what's called Twisp, Washington, on the Cascade Loop on State Route 20. So you kind of loop around uh, the western side of the Cascades. You get on the back side on the eastern side, and then you can hook into uh, mystery camp. And... So we'd been there a couple days, and I mean, there were some guys, there were other people there. We had RVers in the area we were camped in. We pitched a tent. We were sleeping or staying in the tent, and then we would head out during the day and hunt. And uh, I remember this one day. This is when that weird stuff happened. I, I kind of, you know, and uh, I, I really don't know how to explain it, you know, or, or basically what happened. But I remember as we're walking into the, the forest part, that's considered wilderness. And there was a sign that said, you know, beware of bears. So Washington State back then would tell you that grizzlies weren't in the state. But they had a sign, not of a black bear, but of a, you know, a brownie. And so you figure we're probably only 50, 60 miles from the Canadian border. Uh, you got Montana and Idaho, you know, probably uh, a three and a half, four hour drive to the uh, east of us. So it's very possible that there would have been a grizzly bear. So, you know, or or in the area. So I really wasn't worried about it because I've never come across anything in the outdoors that, you know, that that really 
scared me. So we get to hunting and we get to this one spot where I got to drop down in like a draw. And I get down in here and I'm kind of walking along this and I notice that I, I feel like I'm starting to get in a tunnel. And I mean, at this point, I'm, I'm standing in it so I can walk in here and I'm looking around and it's like everything was woven together at the top. And I'm thinking, this is odd, you know. Now, my buddy Pete, he's running off uh, on the backside. We kind of split up. And so I'm starting to go into this tunnel, you know, and I got my rifle and I'm starting to stoop over. And, you know, and as I go in a little further now my knees are bent and I'm kind of starting to crouch down to get in there and it's getting smaller. And I just remember like almost every step I'm going in into this massive feeling of oppression. You know, and I'm a spiritual guy. I'm a Christian. So when I talk about spiritual oppression, you know, or, or um, you know, people will talk about being a place where the, the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit comes and it feels like it's crushing you to the floor. Like you got all this weight pressing and squeezing you know, like the air out of you, right? And so I'm starting to feel like this as I'm getting further and further in this like tunnel. And when I think back, you know, I, you know, and, you know, maybe this is just my memory now, but it feels like every step, not only was it more oppressive, but it was darker and darker. And I remember, you know, a few more steps and I'm thinking, you know, this is the end, right? If I take one or two more steps that, you know, I'm going to have a meeting my doom moment, you know? <laughs> And so it's probably the closest I've ever been in my life to almost like an outright panic, you know, and I've never been susceptible to this, right? I was in the Navy. I worked on a flight deck of an aircraft carrier. I've seen uh, horrible things happen to people, aircraft accidents, um, all sorts of things. And so, you know, I, I'm not one who's easily intimidated by things, but in this moment, I'm, I'm scared, you know. So anyway, I back out as fast as I can. And I'm, uh, I'm backing out. You know, I got a single shot rifle in my hand. I've got uh, a big old belt knife I made. I mean, that thing was 12, 14 inches like a buoy knife, you know. And I got that on my belt and that's it, right? And so I'm like, well, whatever's at the other end of this tunnel, you know, I don't want to meet this, right? Sure. So, and, uh, and Russell, if you got any questions and you need to ask something, just go ahead and let me know. I don't mind stopping. And so anyway, I get out of this tunnel. And right away, it's like uh, everything's gone, right? I'm, I'm, you know, the fear, the intimidation, I mean, all of this stuff, it's all gone. The sun's shining, and I'm thinking it's almost like a happy moment. And, you know, maybe that's like I just survived this. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I was, it was, you know, it was, uh, I, you know, this euphoria of like, oh, my God, I'm out of this, right? And so it just seemed kind of weird. But, you know, I remember that. Like this whole, it was like a brush tunnel, like something had made this, you know, and, uh, and has, you know, when Russell and I were talking about this, it's kind of like a garden trellis, you know, except this thing was 40, 50 feet long going in there, right? And just narrowing down like a funnel. And, uh, and so, and it, there's a little bit more to this, you know, that I didn't tell Russell, but so I'm standing in front of this opening and I'm looking around and I basically turn 180 degrees backwards. So I'm facing, you know, like the rear and I'm standing there and I'm looking up at this up on this ledge. And so, like I said, it was a little draw and it was probably seven, eight foot high. And uh, and there was uh, there's a big brush there, but it had maybe like 18 inches of clearance underneath that brush. So, you know, it, it came up and then poof, a big old um kind of like a hedge that somebody's trim, right? But there's 18 inches of clearance underneath this thing. And I'm looking at this and I see, and this is really weird. I see what looks like a deer underneath this thing looking at me. And I've got my rifle and I'm staring at this thing, right? Because I see the big like muley ears on this thing and I'm looking at it and all of a sudden it disappears, right? And it's kind of like, and I'm telling you, it's kind of like an army crawl backwards, like on elbows getting out. And I'm sitting there, and at this point, I had snapped my rifle up, and I'm looking at this thing through, you know, full buckhorn iron sights. But I'm not squeezing the trigger because my mind is like, what the heck am I seeing? So I don't know. I, I don't know what this is. I don't know what's going on. I don't pull the trigger. It, it gets out of view, and I'm standing there kind of confused, like, what the heck just happened? 
Sure. And uh, I see a pair of boots come walking up. And uh, I'm looking at these boots coming right up there in the back of that brush where this thing had been, you know. And uh, it comes around a corner brush, and it's my buddy Pete. And I'm like, what the heck? And so I tell him this. I'm, and he was like, well, there was nothing. I didn't see anything when I was coming up to the brush. And this is a couple of seconds after this thing moved. So sure. if it, it w whatever would have been there, would have uh, he would have seen it, you know. And so it was just odd, flipping odd. I have no explanation for that, right? And so, you know, we pack out of there and we, you know, we get back to the camp and, and we got skunk. Neither one of us dropped a deer. And uh, so this would have been 91 and uh, mystery camp. That was a mule deer hunt up there. So this would have been probably early October. What was nice about Washington, if you hunt black powder, you can start deer season pretty much, I think, around the – it used to be end of August, and you could hunt off those tags all the way through the end of the year. And then if you got an elk tag, you can carry that elk tag into the first part of January, right? So you, got, so you got like six months of hunting on a deer and an elk tag, right? So – you know, that kind of petered out. We left. We didn't get anything. And it was just a weird, a weird experience I had, you know. And uh, so now we get, now we flash forward. It's a couple of months. We're hunting in a place called P.L. Washington. Two words, P-E-E-L. And it's on, it's on Washington State Route 6. You go to Chehalis and basically you take, uh, you know, whichever way you're going. If you're going north, you take a left. If you're going south, you take a right. And you head straight to the West Coast. And that, that Highway 6 will take you all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And you hit, uh, I think it's Longview or Long Beach. It's been, you know, I've been out of the Navy, oh, my God, 35, 36 years. So it's been a while since I, you know. And uh, so PL is, is, I don't know, 40 minutes, an hour or so from Chehalis. And we had gone to hunt there. And we were in Weyerhaeuser Tree Property. So... We had gone in here in the morning. We'd gotten in, and this was a day before uh, the season started. So we were on a combination deer and elk hunt. So basically, if it's on four legs and you know, and it's got whitetail, mule deer ears, or elk ears, we were able to harvest and take it. Okay. And uh, so we were pretty optimistic going up there. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we had driven up, and we started climbing up the mountain, and we had passed some logging equipment. So there were loggers right down there at the base of this hill. And uh, we had driven up there. We saw this nice little clearing. And I remember we were talking about that would be a nice place to camp. But we wanted to get away from the loggers. So we drive up this mountainside. And, uh, you know, we're probably up there for two or three hours driving around trying to find a place to camp. And at one point, we got about six inches of water running down the road we're driving on. And I'm hugging the side of the mountain. The ins You know, the uh, I'm driving. So I could reach out and touch the side of the mountain <laughs> on my left side. And Pete could almost open his door and step on treetops, you know, from the timber coming up on the other That's side. So that, road is. <laughs> that, so that was pretty scary stuff. And then we're like, oh, my God, we got about six inches of water running down this road, you know. And I'm thinking like, holy cow, we could, you know, we could not make it off this hill, you know, if we had a mudslide or something. So it was uh, – Real pucker factor driving for probably okay. about 40 minutes, you know. And so and it, it was kind of weird. So we finally – we come to this one spot, we and we stop because there's this big old three-foot-high dirt berm on this road we're driving on. And we get out to take a look at, well, what the heck's blocking it? And we climb up this little berm, and there's a, a little stream probably about eight, ten inches deep and about three feet wide on the other side of that berm. And then there's that campground we had looked at when we first pulled in the park. So we decided uh, this is a sign from above. Let's camp here. So we kind of made our way around. And so we had pitched our camp. And we spent our first day there. Uh, like I said, it was it was the day before the opening, you know, opening day. And so we had gotten out there, brought a chainsaw. We had cut, you know, half a cord of wood. And so let's kind of give you a layout. So we're in a it's, – it's kind of a pullout. And part of it's graveled. That has the road part that's got gravel and then you know to one side you got this little stream running alongside we got the gravel and then where we pitched the tent that was all grass uh, a grassy uh not not soggy but um 
you know, Washington State, you could almost, uh, you know, you could grab a shovel and just stick that thing in or turn it over. So it was firm dirt, but uh, not hard, not hard Scrabble kind of dirt. Yeah. So, uh, and and in that area where we were, the grass was short, so we were able to lay the tent on that stuff, and it was a little bit of a cushion. But behind the tent, you know, we got grass that's probably, you know, 24, 30 inches high, you know, so it's, it's knee-high, waist-high grass growing back there. Uh, there's some... Uh, I don't know if it had been cut, but we had some timber that was behind there that had been there for a long time. So we started taking a chainsaw, cutting that. And so I would backed my truck in, dropped the tailgate. And on the right side of my truck, we had a little space you could walk through in that tailgate. And that's where we put the front of our tent. So you would have the truck tailgate and then the, the, the front of our tent was, you know, kind of behind it. So we had this whole open area, which was our camp you know, where we had our fire in that open area. Sure. And so we had pitched the tent. Uh, I had made a camp kitchen, you know, a big old uh, plywood tote that carried my stove, all, the, all of our cooking gear. And uh, we carried that out. We set it up on a table alongside, alongside the side of the tent where Pete slept. We had a bunch of five gallon collapsible water jugs. So these were all full of uh, water. And so that stuff was laying up on the side where he was. And we had three or four feet, and that's where we kind of had the camp kitchen. And so we had tables set up there, which was, you know, if the from the face of the tent, these things are sitting over here facing that little creek we had. And uh, and so, and in that little open horseshoe area, we had built our campfire. And on the other side of that, across from the tent, we had stacked up all the wood and we had stapled like a space blanket up there. So this was bouncing the heat from our campfire towards the tent. Okay. So that's, that's kind of our setup. And basically you go on the other side of that wood we had piled up. That's where we had our running water if we needed water. Right. So we had been up here. Uh, we were there, gosh, five days, maybe six tops. And uh, probably we'd been there halfway through the week. So this is, this is late November. So we're catching a, you know, um, on the west side of the Cascades, you know, you don't get a lot of snowfall. You might on the east side because the west side, you've got all that salt air from the ocean. Sure. So, you know, we got a lot of uh, um, uh, sleet. You know, we've got uh, freezing rain and stuff like this. So we had gone up in there and we had hunted and we would get up in the morning. We would drive up the hill. We'd find a meadow or something like that. And we would go hunt this place. So we'd been there, I don't know, probably halfway through our, our, our stay. And uh, we get back one day and uh, we're not, we, we didn't bring watches or nothing because we aren't keeping track of time. Um, so when, it's, when the sun sets out in the mountains out there, well, you know, if you're outdoors and when the sun goes down and there's no city or urban lights around, it's dark. It's real dark pretty quick, you know. You know, so it could have been six o'clock in the afternoon and it's already like pitch black out here, you know. And uh, so we'd been sitting around the campfire and what we had done was we'd always take a couple big chunks of log about a, you know, 10, 12 inch piece. And we would throw that on our campfire and uh, that would give us some light for a couple hours and then it would stop burning. Basically, we'd lose the open flame and then it would sit there and you just have this nice uh, bed of coals underneath there. So when we got up in the morning, we'd flip that thing over and get our breakfast fire going and so this is the night it got weird so i'm kind of laying in my cot i have a cot and i'm laying in that my sleeping bag and i'm laying on my my left side and i'm looking across the tent where pete is and he's in a mummy sleeping bag on an air mattress and it's pretty cold out there and so pete is zipped up where all i see is this much of his face in a mummy bag right so i can't see his ears i just see his face and you know, we're talking about what we're going to do, and then, you know, it gets quiet, right, because we're, we're, we're basically both ready to fall asleep or trying to fall asleep because we're going to be up at, you know, 5 in the morning to go hopefully pop an elk. And uh, it gets kind of quiet, and all of a sudden he's like, you hear that? And I'm sitting here like, what? And he goes, there's something outside. Do you hear it? You know, and, and um, I'm like, no, I don't hear anything. And. And I want your listeners to know that I was in naval aviation. So I worked on the loudest jets the Navy has, the A6 and the A6B Prowler. So I'm an intruder, Bubba, all the way through. Proud of it. 
intruder, right? So yeah, I'm I'm proud. I'm arrogantly proud of being an intruder, Bubba. That I consider the A6 my first wife, right and uh, so working the flight deck of an aircraft carrier when I'm launching airplanes, you know, all I hear is this high pitched whistle. So I've lost probably, you know, um, my hearing is better now, but back then, you know, you're, you're talking, um, I'm 12 months off doing three cruises. Right. So, and I'm still working with jets. Right. So my hearing's not the best. I don't hear, um, you know, I can hear deep bass stuff, but I don't hear kind of like some high end stuff. Right. So I have to pay attention to, uh, you know, if you say there's something down in the valley there and you can hear it, well, I got to have silence and then I got to turn my ear towards that sound and then sure. I can pick stuff up. So I have to work at hearing low end sounds, right? <laughs> so, and, and let me say something about my friend Pete. Pete's a great guy. He was also a SEER instructor in the Navy. So uh, he's a guy that taught the air crew and, and, and uh, pilots uh, survival, escape, resistance, and evasion. He's not a popular guy. These are the guys that play, uh, you know, uh, our enemies and they will do mock interrogations and tortures to these guys, you know, because it's part of the preparing them, you know, under the UCMJ, right, to protect, uh, you know, who you are and stuff like this. So anyway, SEER instructors are not very popular, but these guys know their craft. Uh, for example, he went to train in Canada. He went to a, a Canadian SEER school up there in the winter, and the Canadians picked him up at the airport, and they were driving out to the base where they're going, and then they stop, and he's sitting here like in his dress uniform, and they kick him out with a sea bag, and they're like camps that way like six miles. He goes, I'm butt deep in snow, and it's snowing all over the place, and they left me there, right? So he had to <laughs> use whatever skills he has. That was his introduction in the Canadian SEER school. Wow. So he knows his woodcraft, right? This guy's probably killed – you know, a hundred deer over his life hunting, right? He's, he's good at, he's very skilled in the woods. And so when he starts this, do you hear this? You know, at first I'm like, no, you know? And then after a while, uh, it's kind of amusing because I'm thinking like, oh my God, this dude's freaking out. Right. So I'm watching him get scared. So it's kind of, it's kind of humorous to me at the time, but, uh, you know, this would be every, five minutes six minutes you know don't you hear that or do you hear that and i'm like no i don't hear anything and so at one point i heard a slight rustling you know which might have been like grass swishing or something like that and i thought okay so we got a little bit of wind out here because you could hear a breeze through the trees but it was not enough you know uh I could hear some of that going, but if there was anything else, I could pick that up too. And I didn't hear anything other than the occasional rustling of the trees, you know. And uh, at one point, I heard what sounded like metallic chimes going, you know, uh, like somebody's got five or six dog tags, you know, uh, uh, on, a, on a chime off in the distance. And I thought it couldn't be that, you know, because at this point he's talking about, you know, do you hear this stuff? And I'm thinking, well, what if somebody had a dog and they just drove out there and kicked this dog out to abandon this animal? But I figured a domesticated dog would have come up to our camp, would have made his presence or her presence known and, uh, so, you know, something like that. But we had sure. nothing come up to the camp. So this goes on and on. And so, you know, I'm kind of chuckling at this guy and, and you know, do you hear that, Mark? And I'm like, no. I says, oh, my God. So I'm starting to get frustrated. I'm like, listen. I says, go sleep in the truck. And he's like, I'm not going out there. <laughs> and so so I'm starting to think, like, this guy's losing his marbles. Here he is, Mr. – you know, he's, he's – you know. I was like, oh, my God, you're a seer instructor guy, and listen to yourself, you know. And, uh, and it – couple minutes later, don't you hear that? And I'm like, there's nothing out there. So I told him, I says, well, why don't you unzip the flap of the tent and look out? And he's like, F you, because if I look out and see it, it can look in and see me. And so I'm not taking him serious at this point. Uh, so a couple more minutes goes by. You know, well, this stuff goes on for, you know, and this is probably over a span of like maybe 40 minutes, maybe an hour that this is going on. And, uh, all of a sudden, I hear click, you know, because I kind of I'm starting to drift off a little bit and I hear this click noise and I open my eyes 
And now he's got his arm out of this mummy bag and he's got a Colt Delta Elite 10 millimeter like right up here next side, next to his head. And I'm thinking like, Pete, what the heck? And he goes, there's something outside him. And I was like, oh my God, dude. So, uh, I don't know, one or two more times. Don't you hear that? No, no, no. And then, so this is what him and I called when the wind blew. So, because when we got back, when we got back to the base, we were laughing about how Pete almost shot. Well, we had borrowed this tent from a guy named Mike. And so we're telling Mike, like, yeah, well, that son of a gun, Pete, he almost shot your tent full of holes one night. And Pete's laughing, right? So in my mind, I'm processing this that, you know, we're in agreement with what happened, that it was the wind. But I can tell you that what looked like the wind was not because, you know, you're in a seven by seven or, or maybe eight by eight uh, square tent, you know, uh, right. That's that's a little sure. peaked at the top. And so if the wind blows like up to one side, it's going to shake that whole side of the tent. Yeah. And what I saw was him, he's he's laying in there and he's got his arm up out of the stinking mummy bag and it's zipped up to like here. So now I see this part of him, his face and then his hand in that pistol. All of a sudden, I can only describe it. It's like somebody run alongside that tent, dragging their hand right along Pete's body where he was laying or stick. Because that's the only part of the tent that moved and it went from his head to his flipping feet. And in an instant, that boy was up out of that sleeping bag, and he was crow hopping in the middle of that tent with that pistol, right? And he's doing like a 360 around all directions, and I'm laying in that cot, and I'm looking at this guy's face, and I'm, I'm like ready to crap my pants because I'm thinking if I giggle or breathe or blink, he's squeezing off like all eight rounds in that magazine, right? I'm scared now, not not because of what happened because – I could get shot. And so I'm holding my breath for a couple minutes. And finally, you know, it's like, Pete, you know, I says, uh, hey, you know, put put that gun in safety, you know, drop that hammer, calm down, you know, and he 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 settles down. Now he's standing still and hands come down to his side, the pistols, you know, in a safe mode. And uh, I was like, you all right. He was like, yep, I'm OK. And uh Climbs in the sleeping bag, and I don't know, five minutes later, we're both out. We didn't really discuss it. And uh, so it was kind of odd. And then, okay, so I've told this story before to another podcaster two years ago, three years ago. And his uh, this was Dustin from Crypto PTSD. Mm -hmm. and, he was, and he's basically like, Mark. There's nothing else this could be, you know, you guys had an encounter out there. And uh, and this is, this is um, as I was describing the story, I hadn't gone on his podcast at that time. And I told him, I says, I can't tell this or I'm not going to talk about what happened until I call my buddy Pete. And him and I talk about every five years. And so I called him up and, and him and I both shoot. Uh, one of the things that got us together, I had my FFL back then when I was in the military. Uh, you know, every paid I'm ordering a pistol or, you know, $400 with a powder and bullets and primers. We're loading up ammo and him and I, we work graveyards. So we would get off seven o'clock in the morning. We go shoot till five, four or five in the afternoon, go back, you know, he'd go back to his barracks or whatever. I'd go home and we crash out and then go to work. And so, so I shot. Can you just briefly explain for people who don't know what FFL means? Could you just. Let oh, them sure. Know? That's. That's your federal farms license. I was a I was a dealer, and uh, mostly mostly I bought my own stuff. Because when you start doing the log as an FFL dealer, I can pretty much buy anything I want wholesale. I have to pay the tax to the state for it, you know, the sales tax. But I don't have to declare anything, right? I'm an FFL owner, so I just basically put in my logbook uh, owner stock. That's it. I don't fill anything out because I've already I'm basically as an FFL uh, licensee. I'm already cleared. I don't. I don't have to go through anything. Okay, I didn't. I didn't mean to interrupt. I just didn't want nope. people to be like, "Well, what's that?" <laughs> right. right. And so, you know, at that point, I, I'm buying. I'm buying firearms wholesale. You know, uh, I see pistols nowadays that are. You know, uh, I've got one that I bought back then. Today, if you buy the same pistol, it's a grand, 
and back then I paid, I think about $230 right out of the box, brand spanking new, you know? So it's a, it was a great thing to have. And the FFL back then cost you 30 bucks for three years. Now it's $300 for three years. But, uh, so we, we did, we shot a lot together. Uh, you know, we buckskin together. So we were doing all those activities, rendezvous. We hung out. So if he wasn't taking off to go home with his wife, he was hanging out with, with, uh, with me. And, uh, so, you know, so finally, right before I went on this other podcast, I got a hold of him and I, and you know, we were laughing and, uh, he lives in the Midwest. He was working for Sierra bullets. Right. And, uh, so it was a great opportunity for him. He gets all of his bullets at cost or, or whatever. And, uh, so we were talking basically shop at that point, catching up, you know, what the kids are doing and stuff like this. And I was like, Pete, I says, we got to talk about the tent. And, uh, he got kind of weird. He was like, what do you want to know? And I says, I gotta, I gotta ask you. I says, when you said, do you hear that? I says, what the heck were you talking about? And this is 20, you know, well, I got out in 93. So I've been out, you know, 35, 37, uh, you know, a lot. So this is probably, you know, him and I had, he had retired. I had gotten out roughly a year apart. So both of us been out of the military close to 34, 35 years at that time. <clears throat> and, uh, but we had never really talked about this and I'm going, what were you hearing? And he was going, I was hearing breathing. And I, I couldn't have heard this stuff. I'm, I'm probably four and a half, five feet away from him in this tent. And I don't hear this. So either my hearing's that far out of whack, you know, I probably wouldn't hear something if it was breathing low outside of that tent. And uh, I says, okay, you heard breathing. And I says, my next question is, I go, when the wind blew, and he's like, that wasn't the effing wind. He goes, something touched me. And so at that point, every time I think about this, the hair on my neck stands up. <laughs> and uh, so <laughs> I was like, Son of a gun, dude. I says, well, we got to change the topic, dude, because I've heard enough. And I says, I'm done. I says, Pete, we had a Sasquatch experience. I says, I don't care what you think about it. You, you know, this is this is kind of what's going on. And so, you know, talking to Dustin after this, he goes, it can only be one thing. So there were no other animals. I got up that next morning. I was the first one out the tent, right? Flipped them little logs over, threw a handful of kindling on there, got the fire going. And then I'm walking around in the tent in that morning sunlight, and I don't see anything out there. I don't think I would have heard anything. I wouldn't have heard an elk walking or running away in there because with that soft dirt and that grass padding it, I don't think I would have heard anything. But I, I certainly didn't see anything. So that was kind of a, I, I'd say probably, a, you know, Pete had the experience. I got to watch this from like five feet away. So that was, uh, nowadays, that was pretty cool. You know, back then it was kind of funny because I thought the guy was losing his marbles. But, sure. <laughs> yeah. You know. So, and now we can go up to uh, a couple years ago. This isn't my story, but this is uh, my ex and my daughter's story. And this is local here in Arizona. So, and for those of you who don't know, I live here in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, Arizona's got plenty of Sasquatch activity. Um I'm at work. I get a text from my ex going, hey, we ran into Bigfoot. And I'm annoyed. Not that I got a text at work, but that she's, you know, what the hell are you doing? Because I totally believe in this. And yeah, I kind of take this watchy fun. stuff serious. <laughs> and so I'm like, uh, so I kind of ignored this, right? And I'm thinking like, oh, my God. And and uh, I'm divorced. I, of course, I said my ex, I'm divorced. But we had, uh, you know, an amicable divorce. We're very good friends, okay? She's probably my best friend. So, um, you know, when we divorced, we decided not to be jerks for the sake of our kid. And we're, we're pretty good friends. And that's awesome. So, thank you. So... So I get home and she's texting me again. She's like, you didn't, you didn't say anything about Bigfoot. And I'm like, are you kidding? I says, why are you messing with me? Right. I got other things better to do than have my ex tease me about Bigfoot. And she goes, Mark, she goes, I got to tell you what happened to me and, uh, you know, and your daughter. And so I was like, well, what's going on? So this day started out as a lark. She basically told my daughter, let's go squatching. And my daughter's like, well, heck yeah, let's go. And so my daughter, my daughter has heard all the stories. I, we talk about Bigfoot all the time. We go on a drive, you know, I'm like, look out here, look out there, you know, look for 
tree structures, weird things. So she's kind of in tune. And Bigfoot was more of a fun topic for her. But when we went to visit this area back in uh, this past January, she was she was afraid to go in there. She didn't want to she didn't want to leave the proximity of the car. And uh, so th this went out on, on a joke. And so this is two years ago, uh, late August, early September. And this is along the Gila River. So the Gila River runs um, off Arizona, the state state highway 77. So basically between Mammoth and Globe, Arizona. And this is about in the middle of that stuff. So the Gila comes out of the uh, out of Lake Apache and it kind of flows south and then it it it, it butts right up against uh, 77 and then just drops straight down uh, through like Hayden and all that stuff, okay? So they go to this place. And my ex is going, we kind of decided to go as a joke, but I started thinking about Bigfoot. And she goes, I remember they had closed this place. When uh, when she remarried, they went out there to go visit this because this was a place she visited as a, as a kid. They used to go camping and fishing there all the time. And she goes, uh, I go with my husband and my daughter. And my daughter at that time was probably four or five years old. And it was closed because uh, they had a bear sign like uh, somebody had gotten attacked by a bear or, or – or, uh, um, I, I don't think it was mall, but there was an aggressive bear in an area. So they closed, they closed this area down. And, uh, so she's like, I want to go and check this out. So when she started talking about that, I'm looking this stuff up and I'm like, oh yeah, well, I remember there had been some areas that they closed out because bears had gotten a little too aggressive with people. And, uh, so they're making their way down to the river and, uh, and my daughter starts telling me like, well, dad, you know, remember when you was talking about the tunnel, right? She brings up mystery camp. She goes, we're, we're crawling like a duck walking through this area. And she goes, it's tied together at the top. And I'm like, you're kidding. And she goes, no, she goes, we're literally, and, and my ex is like, oh my God, she, yes. She goes, we were going through there. And, and my daughter's telling her mom, she goes, this is exactly what dad was talking about. And so I'm thinking, well, that's kind of groovy, right, that they're seeing this stuff. And she goes, there were some kind of weird tracks in the mud along the river. And uh, so I'm like, well, you know, that's probably birds. And this area has got open range cattle. And I'm going, it could have been, you know, anything. But, uh, you know, they didn't go in there with a mindset. They're not into casting footprints or anything like this, you know. So they they get down in the water. And at this point, I, every time I've gone and see the Gila, it's near thigh deep. You know, they release the water from Lake Apache and it flows down, it flows downstream. And, you know, you're talking, you could have two feet, three feet of water in here and probably deeper in some pools. Well, right now it's ankle deep where they're at and that's the whole length of the river. So they walk back there. I think they said probably a half a mile, three quarters of a mile. And they were actually able to get up on the opposite side. Uh, you know, real close to the opposite side. And and for your listeners, I sent Russell some pictures of what that area looks like. And it's real, it's real dense. Uh, it's forest in that area and uh, cottonwoods. And I mean, so you're talking, you've got timber that's probably what, 20, 30 feet high in those pictures. It's a lot of trees in that area along that river, riparian uh, uh, environment. And they got to this point and they stopped to take pictures. So my daughter took a picture of my ex and my ex is, you know, she comes in the story like, well, we're taking a picture. And then I heard like a tree limb snap behind me. And I'm like, what do you mean a tree limb? She goes, I heard a snap and I'm going, well, how far away was it? She goes, Mark, it sounded like it was like 10, 12 feet behind me. And so I was thinking like, well, that's kind of odd. Did you look at it? You know, or, and she was like, no, we just decided to leave. And they both felt kind of creeped out where they were in this picture or, you know, where they took this photograph. Sure. And so they decided to, to kind of work their way out of the area. So they get about, I guess, I don't know, the, the, a little distance away, maybe halfway across the river. And then all of a sudden uh, they hear a big old splash, something threw a rock at them because they could hear the splash of the water and then you know, rocks clacking together when you drop a rock on another one or something. And it was, you know, she goes, it was a big one because it made a big splash and a big clacking noise. So, and I'm thinking, well, 
you know, I think Amani Python and the Holy Grail when the two guys are on the wall talking about a swallow carrying coconuts. I mean, so there's no animal that could project a rock unless it's got opposable thumbs and fingers, hands, right? What could throw a rock? And this is not a place where you have uh, campers. It's not a place where there's, uh, well, you might camp on one side of the river, but nobody's out there. Um, there's no homeless people that live in this area. So it's not, it's not uncivilized or uninhabitable, but it's a rough place to be. And nobody's going to be there unless they're a fishing along the bank, you know, or hiking or something like that in there. And there was nobody in that area. So they had the rock throw. So they felt really nervous. So they decided to get out of the area. So they left and they started walking up the trail to get up to the car. And then they heard like a long series of like grunts, like these uh, uh, kind of grunts. And uh, I'm going, you know, so I kind of describe what, the, you know, I was like, was it kind of like, you know, like, us, uh, you know, and she goes, yeah, there was like four or five of them really loud. We heard them from the river bank, from the river all the way up to the car. And so I thought, well, that's kind of weird, right? Because no, no range cattle are going to, I, well, I don't know. I don't think range cattle grunt like that. No. And <laughs> what's big what's big enough to grunt that's gonna come from the river, which is at this point probably a couple of hundred yards away downhill. I, I you know, I, I don't know, hundred yards, hundred, you know, 150 yards. So something had to project a, a, a loud enough voice, you know, for, for them to hear that coming from the river bottom, basically. So they got in the car and split. And uh, it was probably a year later, year and a half later, when we were driving through, and I told my daughter we had gone up to Sholo, and I was like, "We got to go. We got to pull off the road here." And I got my camera. Let's walk around and, you know, see if we can see something. So that's kind of it. So, right on. No, those are some good experiences, you know. And, and you turned me on to the BFRO. Um, you know, all their all their different sightings. I was looking it up today, you know, for Arizona, and I was surprised that. You know, some of these local sightings not far from here, you know, just up by Lake Mary and, and, uh, um, the hell's the name of the place? Uh, Clear Creek, just over in, uh, um, what the hell's, I can't think of the name of the town. Um, just on the other side of Sedona, basically. Um, yeah, I was amazed at how many how how local oh, it Payson? was. Payson or no, it, it was no, uh, no. Rimrock. 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 Okay. It's just off of seventeen. They were sighting. You know, there was a report over there, um, and and I had heard some stories about you know just up the up the if you take the Verde straight up, you'll get into Sycamore Canyon, and I heard stories that you know um, cattlemen wouldn't take their cattle up there after a certain spot because of, you know, reported creatures or whatever, you know, for whatever reason. And, you know, we used to, I used to work on a train that would go up through the canyon and, and go all the right. way up to town Perkinsville. And we'd have, well, you'd hear somebody say, oh, there's a bear. I never saw it. And I'm wondering, was it a bear? You know? Sure. Because cause you would hear it like the, the engineer or something from the front of the train would be like, oh, there's a bear sighting and, and it's going to be on your left or on your right. And by the time it gets to the, you know, it's almost to the end of the train, that thing's moved. It's, you know, it's not where it was. Right. And it, it wasn't until recently when I got into this, you know, into Sasquatch or whatnot, that I started thinking, well, was it a bear? You know, because after I heard those reports of how the cattlemen wouldn't run their cattle up that way, um, they'd go around to get up to flag, um, Flagstaff for anybody who's listening. So, yeah, it's it's pretty interesting. Uh, there's a lot of areas out here that, you know, that I want to check out. You know, I'm, I'm not, not afraid to go out in the woods. You know, I know if you go out in the woods, you're going out armed. I, I don't I don't think I need to be armed, you know. It might be foolish, but I just that's my personal preference is I, I'm not gonna go into the woods armed. You know, I'll have a camera and you know, an All attitude. Right. <laughs> right. Um Yeah, it's yeah. 
I, I don't think pe people think of Arizona as uh, I've got cousins. Okay, so my father is originally from Maine. I, I know where you you're know? going. And so I got cousins, and they're kind of like, there's nothing out in Arizona but rattlesnakes and Indians. And it's kind of like, oh my God. They have you no know, idea, man. No they clue don't that up in the Mogollon, it's, you know, that's all forest. You get down. Uh, Southern Arizona, we've got the Sky Islands, right? So any any mountain range over what is it, 4,000, 4,500 feet, you start to get riparian environment, uh, you know, capable of supporting, uh, you know, running water. You've got big timber, and uh, I wanted to say something like uh, almost half the species of birds and stuff in this country will make their homes in these Arizona, and these Sky Islands are from California all the way through New Mexico and in part of, uh, I want to say, western Texas down into Mexico in the Sonora Desert. So there's, what is it, something like 60 different mountain ranges that are considered sky islands. And if they can support deer, black bear, cougar, they can support Bigfoot. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, and, and like Russell and I had talked, I was like, well, why don't we have them up here in the Catalinas just north of Tucson? My God, I could be up there in 40 minutes. You know, but uh, nobody, nobody would... I haven't heard any stories. I've heard a one story of a Bigfoot sighting back in 73 or 74 in Sabino Canyon, which is a really popular hiking place here in Tucson. So, uh, but we've got, you've got uh, Fort Huachuca. You got all the mountains down there. That's a big old army base. Nobody's running around there. There's plenty of room for them there. Patagonia. Oh, yeah, as long as there's Canyon, water and yeah. food, that's all they need. And, and for, for the folks listening, if you don't know what a riparian area is, it's, like, through my town, we have the Verde River, and it's a 200-mile river. And as it goes through the desert or, or the high desert up here, you know, it's it has its own environment. I mean, it's, you know, um, the trees and, and how do you describe it? I mean, <laughs> it's... It's all what? Cottonwoods and willows cottonwoods and tall and, grass? Yeah, and mesquites, yeah. you know, everything that just for 200 miles, I mean, it goes... Through desert, but it's a greenway, and yes, you know you do you get deer and 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 waterfowl and oh um, what else elk and you know it's it's a viable source of I mean, I mean you know something can survive there you know right. so you know I told you recently I was up and that was that's funny that I thought about this um, Dead Horse Ranch State Park. There was a sighting there, um, and Dead Horse is right in this town that I live in. Um, there was a report there I saw today on, on BFRO, so I was surprised at that. And last week, I was I was in the area where they had the sighting. I had no idea. And it's where I was. I found a, I'll call it a tree structure. Right. And I, I just had this feeling it was man-made just because of where it was at. Right next to the river, it was more like a blind structure. Um, but it was it's a heavily traveled area, you know, with, with, with people. That, you know, we get people swimming in the river and fishing. And, you know, I'd like to think it's, you know, it was made by a, a Bigfoot. Or, right. But I just, I just get the feeling it's man-made, you know. Right. But it's interesting because, you know, we had talked and said, you know, believing in this stuff, everything, everything you do, every time you go into the into the woods or to the lake or to the river, you know, you go there to go fishing and you end up squatching, right. <laughs> you know, right. you're always looking around, you're always like looking for tree structures or breaks or you're always distracted and you, know, you end up doing more of that than you do actual fishing. <laughs> right. I went, uh, I went fishing with a buddy of mine. We go up to uh, Seneca Lake, which is north of Globe. Actually, it's right before you hit the Salt River Canyon, probably, I don't know, five or six miles before uh, as you're heading towards Sholo. Uh, you'll kind of hit this plateau Well, you got Seneca Lake right there. And then, like I said, it's probably five miles or less and you start dropping down in the Salt River Canyon. And we like to go fishing up there on the reservation. And, you know, we went up there. This was... December, so it really wasn't so cold. Uh, it hadn't iced up or nothing like that. We were able to back right down. The lake was full. Uh, we backed right down to the water's edge with my car. We had set up chairs, and uh, you know, we're 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 we go up in the winter to fish for trout. The 
they limit you to 10 catfish, 10 trout, 10 bass. Uh, so that's a lot of fish compared to, you know, going down south here where, you know, you might be limited to four. So we four. like running up there. I yeah. mean, 20 trout, that'll put a lot of trout in our freezer, you know, yeah. between the both of us. And we're sitting up there and we're driving. You kind of, if you look at Seneca Lake, you kind of follow this road and then they've got this, uh, well, they kind of built a dam up and then that flows downhill, but you can drive across this dam and there's a little turnout that you could drop down alongside the, the lake there. And it stopped. So we had backed down in there. So my, my car is parked up on this incline and uh, we had unloaded everything and set up down there. But I kept hearing these snaps up on this little hill behind us. And I'm thinking, you know, I keep looking over my shoulder. And he's like, what are you doing? I was like, oh, don't worry about it. <laughs> I says, uh, I says, I'm going to go up the truck, grab a bag of chips. You know, I says, you want you want some while I'm there? And uh, meanwhile, I'm going up there and, you know. I'm making sure the AR is sitting in the back where I can grab it. I got the 357 out. You got to be careful up there. That's reservation, right? So the native police ain't going to be too happy if you're yeah. out there blasting, right? You don't. On that. Yeah. So it's kind of like uh, I'll have it up in my car, but we're not running around. With, I'm not running around with a pistol on my hip, but I want something out so I can, you know, if I so I can get to my truck quick enough. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's a. Uh, and, and again, one of the things I saw, I start, you know, they had a Facebook page. They've had a lot of aggressive bear. They've had people run out of there. I mean, guys are starting to grill hamburgers and they've got uh, black bears coming right up to them, you really? know, taking their, their patties off the grill. And I'm thinking, you know, probably, uh, you know, I, I don't think it was a bear. We didn't have anything out other than like a bag of potato chips. I feel horrible, right? I consider myself somewhat of a prepper. I got this small portable grill. I went out and I bought all these little propane tanks. I bought a big pack of hamburger patties frozen. I got all the stuff. We get up there, and I'm telling my buddy, it's like, you got a lighter of matches? Oh, don't smoke. Why do I have that? And I'm like, well, I didn't bring none, so we couldn't light the damn grill, right? So we're up there like, well, we got to live off these stupid uh you know Everybody breakfast you know stuff. banana muffins i bought and thank god I, we stopped and i bought a bunch of snack food because we just starved up there and then i get all the way home and i open up the doggone lid and there was one of them little starters in i just never cracked the lid so we could have had hot meats up there you know but uh i kept thinking this whole time like well you know there's no smells that's gonna pull a bear in unless they like the smell of berkeley power bait going on our trout hooks right but uh I was, I tell, I don't know how many times I was looking over my shoulder and I'm thinking like, uh, I'm going to go up towards the front of the car because at that we're at the top of this little hill and I could look straight across. And uh, I didn't bother with it, you know, because I heard, I don't know, probably 20, 30 times something back there walking in that grass, you know, snapping limbs and stuff like that. But when we got out on that culvert, started walking, you know, driving out, you know, I'm stopping and I'm watching that stuff. I got my binoculars. I'm like, oh, there's nothing out there. Let's just go. But, uh, yeah, you don't know. And, and that whole area, that Seneca Lake, um, Brenton Sawn, before he passed away, I want to say it was him. He had interviewed a woman who was from the, uh, the White Mountain Apache tribe. Okay. And she talked about how they were driving up to uh, the casino. Uh, what's that one east of Sholo? No, it's not Honda, is it? Is it Honda? Honda's near up by Payson, isn't it? It's like between Payson and... I'm not sure. There's, there's, there's one. I want to say is I don't have a, I don't have it out, and I, and I don't gamble, but uh, I want to say it's probably, it's probably east of Sholo, Big Lake, somewhere around there. But you can, uh, yeah. I, I think you go through what is it, Fort Apache up the highway there on that side of Sholo to the east of Sholo. But there's a casino, and uh, she had told a story about how you know this Bigfoot, her son had seen this thing, uh, off on the side of the road running, you know pacing the car for a little bit while they're going down the highway and this is 20 30 miles from where we're fishing and you know you got a seven eight foot tall animal you know that's got a you know 50 60 inch stride i mean i think they could do 20 30 miles in a day a lot quicker than i can oh you know? yeah but so they, yeah considering what they supposedly how fast they run I mean, if they if they ran full speed for an hour, they're at your, you know it takes an hour, so they can cover, you know, probably easily. I mean, not that they're going to run full out for you know that long, but they they can 
make up some time and some some you know some distance in a day. Right. Um, so people who think, oh, well, that's ten miles away, they're not over here. Yes, they are. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm. You they're, know, they're, you think about everywhere. this like, what's what's the daily range of like a cougar? You know, I wanted to say I read somewhere it was like forty miles. Those things can cover in a day in in their patrol or whatever you want to call it. You know, while they hunt for walking. food. That's walking. That's not a. That's not in a rush. So I think a Sasquatch, as long as there's plenty of water on the way, and uh, and if everybody thinks we're all desert, yes, you get down in a southeastern, southwestern Arizona. There's a lot of desert, but so much of this land is agriculture, right? So we're running uh, irrigation canals. There's stock tanks for cattle and and. There's available water out there. There's water all over the place. Oh my God, how many golf courses does Arizona have? <laughs> we got we got more golf courses than what is it? Wisconsin's got lakes, is my guess. So, um, there's there's more there's more golf courses in Arizona than there are in Scotland. Yeah. Well, I was uh, going to say Minnesota. What's that? Land of ten thousand lakes. I think we got yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, listen, man, I really enjoyed your, your, your stories and, and I really want to thank you for, for coming on and sharing them. Sure. Um, You're welcome. They, that was really awesome of you. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm flattered that, you know, people see me and they're like, oh, I want to tell him my stories. I'm like, what? <laughs> it's awesome. You know? Well, you're local, so we're going to do a road trip at some point. Oh, absolutely, dude. That's what I was going to say. If you, you know, you, you come up north, you know, I'll, I'm I'm down to go into the woods, absolutely, and and just go and explore, go fishing. You know, I love my fishing. I'm I'm a fisherholic. Oh, me too. Me sometimes I well, I'm not going to say that. That's inappropriate, but I love to fish. So, but uh, yeah, I bring my gold pans, and I'm really good at looking. Uh, what's the word unassuming and uh i can definitely play the part like i'm looking like a loss i could be attractive to a squat who's looking for somebody to uh follow and poke around look at that unsuspecting fool i'm really good at that you know <laughs> so, but uh yeah we'll, we'll get together i appreciate this thank you very much and uh and thank you all for listening so awesome and uh i'll be in touch soon and, and all right you so once again, I want to thank Mark for coming on the show today. Uh, your stories are really awesome, and I and I really do appreciate it. I also appreciate the fact that you know that that you served our country for twelve years. Uh, that's amazing, and thank you again for that. Um, if you guys enjoyed the video, please you know share your love, hit the like, subscribe, and share below. And if you have a story you want to tell, you know, you can get me in touch with me, email me at uh, monstermogion at gmail.com, or you can find me on Facebook at uh, Mogian Monsters. You know, you can get in touch with me there, friend request me, you know, do what you want. Um, you guys will notice I did things a little differently today. Um, I'm learning, you know, I, I never recorded this way with Skype and, and the, the split screen and then I somehow screwed up and... It was just him, but, uh, it, it worked. Um, yeah, again, if you guys enjoyed it, show your love and, uh, I'll see you guys soon. And, and thank you guys so much for watching and, and peace and God bless. All right.